Uh, we've been studying Peter's teaching concerning righteousness uh, in the midst of suffering. And to summarize Peter's teachings thus far, uh, we'll look back at our outline, starting in verse 13 of the third chapter. Peter basically says, if we are zealously pursuing good, we have peace. In general, we have peace with those around us. But if we should suffer for righteousness, uh, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, you're blessed because your faith is stronger than the outside forces, outside pressures. Number two, we need to remember that Christ is Lord over all authority. He's the one that we need to fear above all else and obey. Number three, in these situations, we have an opportunity to witness. And thus, he, Peter instructs the believers to be ready to give a defense for the hope that's in them. Uh, and the reason why they live differently. And then number four, it's better to suffer for doing what is right than to do what is wrong. Uh, knowing that uh, if it's God's will, he has a purpose, he has a plan. We saw all four of those points in the example of Christ, which Peter gives. And then Peter then instructs the believers about the two different directions of life. The f he commands them to resolve to live for the will of God. And then he talks about the former life that was consumed with pursuing the pleasures of man. And if you've noticed in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Peter introduces the new topic of living for the will of God, but he primarily discusses the old direction, away from God and apart from God. And he reminds us of the four ramifications. The first one is personal ramification, which is that that life in that old direction was empty. It was filled with unsatisfying self-indulgences. Number two, it had social ramifications. Uh, the old life, the old direction, is not compatible with the new direction of life, which is based on God's will, not the, your own will, the sinful will of men. Uh, number three, that old direction has eternal ramifications. It has eternal ramifications because uh, everyone who follows that path will have to stand before God and give an account for their lives and how they lived it and, and the choices that they made. Number four, it also has a missional ramification, meaning this is the reason why people preach the gospel to give others hope for their souls after death. Uh, so focusing on one's relation to the old direction, what's not there? What's not there is what Peter now turns to in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, which is his instructions concerning the community of God, concerning our new direction. So this morning we're going to study four instructions for us that reflect the new direction of our life. They are four connected topics that focus on the practical life of the Christian. So if you ever wanted a list of four of the most practical and most important things that God wants his church to carry out, here we go. So let's read the whole passage first before we begin. Starting in verse four, uh, 7 of chapter 4, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God, and whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, now that we saw the whole forest, the whole passage, let's go ahead and look at the first instruction Peter gives concerning mindful praying in verse 7. Uh, the first part of verse 7 says, The end of all things is near, therefore. So he makes a statement of fact that the end, the goal of all things is near. The word for near, the verb for near is a perfect tense, means it has come and thus it is near. And what is he referring to? He's referring to that in the resurrection and ascension of Christ, God has inaugurated the last days, the final stage of his redemptive plan before the second coming of Christ and the judgment of all things, when all things will end. Uh, and so we will meet that either in one of two ways. We are either going to die uh, and then stand before God, or we'll be here during his second coming. Either way, that end is near. Our time is limited. Now in Greek, uh, at the beginning, there's actually a conjunction. There's actually a but or a now. Uh, so it links 
verses 7 through 11 with the previous passage concerning our old way of life. Uh, and there are uh, two phrases, two previous thoughts in the passage that links to this time element of the end of all things is near. In verse 2, it talks about uh, that we're to live the rest of the time in the flesh. No longer for the lust of man, but for the will of God. It focuses on our limited amount of time here on this earth in this circumstances. And then also in, chapter, in verse 5, it says, uh, it talks about God being ready to judge the living and the dead. So in the emphasis in that passage, and then the emphasis in which Peter is bringing into as the foundation of this passage we're studying today, is that our time on earth in this life is limited. And thus, how we live is very important. Specifically because God is ready to judge everyone. Those who have already died and those who will be alive at his coming. So, how should we direct our lives? That's why he gives us the therefore. Therefore, since we have limited time, therefore we should do something. So this fact should cause us to be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Now, sound judgment has the idea of having an understanding about practical matters and being able to act sensibly. It's to think about and to evaluate uh, the situation maturely and correctly. And when we talk about uh, sober, uh, sober spirit, you notice spirit in the New American Standard is italicized. It means it's not there in the original Greek. Uh, it's the, the New American Standard has it there to make it clear that we're talking about sober in thinking, not necessarily uh, sober opposed to being drunk with wine. So that idea of sober there has the idea of to be in control of one's thought processes uh, and thus not to be in danger of irrational thinking and thus irrational behavior. These two commands of sound judgment and being sober, they're very similar and they do have overlap. And it makes sense given what the previous passage was talking about, the lack of, of self-control before we were saved, where it said, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, of those who don't know God, having pursued a course of sensuality, living for these lusts, sensual, sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you, you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. This is where their lack of self-control, their overindulgences uh, were spent, thinking that this was going to give them meaning, purpose, happiness, fulfillment, identity in life. So, why are the believers supposed to be clear-minded and self-controlled? Well, the text says, for the purpose of prayer. Uh, so, if we're supposed to be clear-minded for prayer, we are to be clear-minded in our prayers. Uh, and in the Greek text, the word for prayer is actually plural. So, it's, pl it's prayers. It's suggesting that we pray more than once during the day. In Judaism, they typically prayed three times in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening. Um, it's not limited to that, but it, it focuses on a continual nature of prayer. And prayer focuses on one's relationship, personal relationship, with God. His communication with God and, and our dependence on His grace. Uh, it's the foundation for the Christian life. And it aligns our wills with, with His. And thus the new direction. Uh, so being of sound judgment and sober in our prayers means that we will be praying intelligently, intentionally, and with a clear thought. And these clear thoughts has two directions. Uh, the first direction is that we need to be alert to the events, the situations, and our part in them to evaluate them correctly in order to be able to pray more intelligently, be able to pray the, God's will in the situations that we see all around us. And then secondly, uh, we need to know uh, we need to know God to whom we are praying and His will. We need to think and know the heart of God. Uh, because godly thinking is at the center of our communion with God. Because the more one knows a person's mind, the closer the relationship will be. 
Uh, if you talk about someone being your best friend, and yet you don't know what they like to eat, where they like to go, anything about them, well, if you don't know their thoughts, you don't really have a relationship with them. You would never say that. It doesn't make sense. Uh, they're your best friends because you know so much more about them and their minds and their hearts. And the same thing is with God. So Peter's words imply that a prayer, prayer and a prayer life that's based on knowledge of God and a mature evaluation of the situation around us is more effective. Now why? Why is that the case? Well, prayer is our access to spiritual resources. Uh, but we can't pray properly if our minds are unstable due to, number one, worldly pursuits and lusts that are opposed to God's will, because uh, that's going to distract us. It's going to take us in the wrong direction. And number two, we can't pray properly if our minds are unstable due to hurrying or a lack of time. If we don't make the time to pray, we're, our prayer is not going to be effective. Uh, you can't commune with someone or have a relationship with someone in a hurry. That doesn't happen. Uh, number three, if we're ignorant of divine truth, if we don't know God, his character, his nature, and his will, that's going to be an issue uh, for praying. You're not going to be able to pray God's will soberly or, or mindfully. And then number four, if we're indifferent to the divine purposes, to his will, uh, into the heart of God, if we don't want to, we have to intentionally uh, want to pray and ask God for his will for our lives to be carried out through us. Okay, now I want to draw your attention to the structure of this passage. It might be uh, difficult to see, but in Greek, this is all one sentence. Verses 7 through 10 is one sentence. And the main idea or the commands of be of sound judgment and being sober for the purpose of prayer. That's the main thought. And the other three are connected to it. Uh, the other three ideas, instructions. Uh, and before we move on, though, I want to talk about one side note. Uh, notice this whole section is based on the reality of the end times, that the end of all things is near. And so uh, with this view what does Peter tell us to do? In light that the end is near, where does he send us? He sends us to prayer. Notice, he doesn't send us to set a date. He doesn't send us to have, be part of an extreme uh, preparations. Uh, he doesn't tell us to withdraw from society. And there's no overemphasis on correlating occurring events with the details of Scripture. Viewing that the end is near, that our time on earth is limited, that should draw us straight to prayer, straight to communion with God, uh, and asking him uh, mindfully and intentionally, asking for his help. So mindful prayer is the foundation for the three other instructions. And uh, we need to be mindful because our time to serve God on earth is limited. Uh, so my question to you is, do you pray? Are you praying? Do you believe that God is really active and that prayer does anything? Does, does he really move? And is he really the source of all that we are and all that we have? Is he the source of your life, your strength, your ability, your health, your success, your protection, your character, and so many other things? Uh, this is our first practical instruction. It's to be mindful in our prayer. The second is loving unfailingly in verse 8. Uh, by the remember, by the nature of, of the grammar here, the following three instructions are actually objects for and about which we pray. Uh, so the first thing we need to pray is for that love will be unfailing. So let's read uh, the first part of verse 8. It says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Now notice it starts off with above all. That gives the preeminent position and priority to love in the community of believers. This is the most important thing to pray for. And asking God to make love of one another a reality in your life. Love here is agape, which is the expression of one's desire for the good and what is right for the, another, for the glory of God. Love will include self-sacrifice, but will result in self-fulfillment from the joys and blessings of God. 
Love is exercised uh, not by emotion, but it's an exercise of the will. And it's not determined on the person, the object, whether they're beautiful, desirable, or worthy. It's determined by the nobility and the noble intention of the one who loves. It's a decision made by the person. Uh, and in this passage, Peter's saying, keep fervent in your love. The idea of being fervent is the idea of persevering in love, continuing in love, not letting your love waver, uh, but be in devotion to loving one another. Be zealous for it. Uh, pursue it. And Peter has already written something very parallel in his earlier section when he talked about the holiness in our, in our lives, in our living, because we're saved. In chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, meaning accepted the gospel, and thus started a new life of obedience, you purified your souls, purified, cleansed your lives uh, for the goal of a, sin of a sincere love of the brethren, that brotherly love, the community, a family uh, of brotherly love, which all families should have, or the ideal family should have. And the way you get there is fervently loving one another from the heart, sincerely. So he's already talked about this, how important this is. And back in chapter 4, the reason uh, Peter gives for fervent loving one another within the body of Christ is because love covers a multitude of sin. This phrase is a figure of speech, which is also used in James 5.20, that communicates forgiveness. Forgiveness of a multitude, a large amount of sin. And thus, by forgiving, it brings unity. It brings reconciliation. It brings oneness in the body. Look at these Old Testament passages that, could, that explain this figure of speech. Proverbs 10.12 has antithetical parallelism, where the first line uh, is then the opposite is given in the second line uh, where it says hatred stirs up strife but love covers all transgression so hatred the opposite is love stirring up strife causing trouble the opposite is covering all transgression forgiving and then Psalm uh, 85 2 where it says talking about God saying you forgave the iniquity of your people and you covered all their sin uh, Selah this is synthetic parallelism, where the two lines are the same, saying the same thing, but in different words, where their forgiveness and covering are equated. So when we talk about covering, we're not talking about a cover-up of sin, but a forgiveness. And that forgiveness does one of two things. Either forgiveness bears the hurt, an insult or snubbery or sin that someone else has, or if it, that sin can't be let go, if it breaks the relationship, then uh, love... And forgiveness gently exposes to that person uh, the issue, the problem, the, the, the thing that's causing the division. Because that other believer, uh, if they're in sin, that's going in the wrong direction. And they're committed to a new direction of God's, God's will. And that's not their desire to go in the old direction. So by bringing it up, that could be taken care of. Forgiveness could happen and recon reconciliation can occur. And sins can be covered. So forgiveness that brings unity comes out of a commitment of love to a body of people and is necessary for unity in relationships. Uh, the following I want to share with you is a quote from Wayne Grudem's commentary in 1 Peter, which communicates the real-life sense of this verse. Uh, he says, Where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, small offenses and even some large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. But where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion. Every action is liable to misunderstanding. And conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delights. Do we fall into that trap? Uh, are we people that are viewing others in the body with suspicion? looking uh, at being misunderstood or trying to misunderstand and having a lack of love, lack of trust, lack of faith, uh, and causing conflicts, uh, that is Satan's goal, uh, Satan's delight, not God's. In the book of Hebrews, it says something very similar from a negative perspective, 
wherein it says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, the, the favor that God has bestowed on believers, uh, so that, with a result that, no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it, many are defiled. So, we are to, to cling to the graces of God so that there's no root of bitterness springing up, which causes trouble and thus defiles many, causes many to sin and causes division. So what he's saying is that your commitment to love is important to the whole body. This point cannot be overemphasized. And that's why he says, above all, pray this. Pray and align your wills with the will of God and that you should be loving and be committed to loving one another. So the instruct second instruction is love. And what's the third? The third is practicing hospitality. Verse 9. And verse 9 is short. It says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Hospitality here is among the people of God. That's why it says one another. Uh, and it would not mean to house someone or a stranger, uh, like a traveling missionary, a traveling teacher, overnight. Although that was very important, especially in the first century, and that did happen. And there's other passages in the Bible that communicate that we should do this. But here, it's specifically talking about the body of Christ, the local body, other believers in their local community. So rather here, it would primarily be focusing on opening your home to have people over, to enjoy their company, to minister to them, to build a closer relationship. To practice love. This includes, but not as limited to, the house where they would meet for worship. Uh, and it is a command to all believers. And it's also a command to all believers in Romans 12, 13. But Peter adds, without complaint. Uh, now, a complaint here it refers to repeated words of complaining or grumbling or murmuring that's often spoken to others with the result of stirring up rebellion. So th we should be hosting, showing hospitality to others without causing any rebellion, any problems, any division. So the question that I have is, well, about what would the believers complain? Now, in the first century, those who seem to be hosting all the time or more than they are being hosted could complain. No, you're always coming over to my house and always eating my food and always, I'm always having to uh, use my facilities and my resources. Uh, and that is the first group that potentially could be complaining. Uh, in the first century context, many of the people in the church were slaves and they couldn't have people over for meals because they didn't own a home. Uh, they could have people over for visits, but they couldn't necessarily provide for them uh, food and lodging or food and um, fellowship without the permission of their masters. So there, therefore, this task fell on those who had homes. So it's already a smaller group. And so sometimes uh, people could have reasons that were outside of their control uh, for not particularly inviting people over. Although that doesn't excuse them for having an attitude of hospitality and of care and of warmth and of reception and of welcoming. Uh, so those who are blessed with resources to do this, to show hospitality, to have people over uh, for a meal and for fellowship, they should not be complaining about it. They should be thanking God that they have the resources to do that. Secondly, it could refer to a second group uh, who on the rare occasion, has people over, but complains about it and finds some fault in order to justify never doing that again. And then there could also be a third group. And the third group could be those who don't even make an effort to show hospitality to others for whatever reason or excuse which is ultimately sinful. And I'm not talking about those things, people that are, it's outside of their control, but those who just are indifferent to it. Eh, doesn't matter. Not important to me. But here, this is one of the three uh, most important things that we need to pray about is sh and to become a reality is showing hospitality. Uh, so, and, and why is it a problem? Why do we, we cringe? Why do we, so many people not do it? Well, number one, being hospitable involves time. It involves expense. It involves vulnerability, letting people in. 
and involves loving people. Uh, things that are outside of our natural tendencies, things that we have to do because we're in Christ, things that the Spirit of God has to empower us, things that we need to pray for. So the walls that we put up in our minds or the objections that we tell ourselves for not practicing hospitality usually fall into two categories. The first category is external fears. Uh, my house is a mess. My home is not good enough. My home is too good. And I'm way too busy. Now these are external fears. They're really excuses. And we need to ask ourselves, what is important is the relationship, which can happen anywhere. Restaurants, parks. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in your home, but primarily one's home is the place for hospitality because that's personal. You know, meeting on a neutral ground, you're inviting people into your personal space, your environment, your, safe, um, uh, your, your safety zone, your personal home. If you are not using your home and the resources God has given you for this end, which God is communicating as being extremely important, what are you using them for? What are you finding that's more important? Uh, social gatherings were far more prevalent in their culture than in ours. They practically did it every night. Uh, and I'm saying, not saying that you need to do it every night. But this has to be on your radar. Uh, this has to be a priority for you because it's a priority for God. Uh, and if things are priorities they can get done. So now let's just talk about these objections. My house is a mess. Well, if it's a mess, clean it. And if you say it's too big of a job, well, you start a big job with one step, cleaning one thing, and you go on from there. Uh, and you make better habits in your life. Or, or, or in addition to, you have other people help. People in the body, if you were trying to clean your house to be more obedient to God, that, uh, there should be a host of people in, in our body that would run to do that and love to serve you and serve God in that. But the first step is to start. If you say my home is not good enough, well, that's just pride. That, that's saying that things are really more valuable than people, than you. Your relationship, your ministry, your communicating with other people is more important than things. If you say your house is too good, then... You need to remember, everything that you have is really not yours. Everything that you have has ultimately been given to you by God. Um, if you're saying you're too busy, well then you're too busy. You need to reprioritize uh, and have the same goals, the same purposes as God has. And ultimately, such grumbling is ultimately a complaint about God uh, and against God and His order of our circumstances and the things that he's called us as a church, as a body, as his believers to do. So here Peter is commanding hospitality as part of our new direction of life. And you notice Peter doesn't even bother with these external fears. Uh, those are just excuses. Uh, the second uh, fear is eternal, internal fears. Uh, why would they or anyone want to come over and visit me? I'm no one special. I have nothing to offer people. What if they say no? What if they say yes? Uh, what would I do when we're together? Now this internal fear, this is something that Peter gives the answer to in verses 10 through 11, where he talks about serving the needs of one another. Verse 10 says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So your internal fears is that you're not special? That is not what God said. God has gifted each one. You notice it says each one. That means every single person in the body, God has gifted you. And that includes at least one gift, ability, or talent that God has personally given you. Really, it refers to a multitude of things, multitudes of gifts. The word gifts is charisma. Uh, it literally means the result of grace towards you, of God's grace towards you, uh, which you use by the Spirit's empowerment. And it is to be used to serve one another uh, in the body. Where do you serve them? In your homes while you practice hospitality. 
Uh, the word for serve is diakonos. It, it comes from the word that we get deacon from. It literally means an act of meeting someone else's needs. And we all have needs. We have physical needs, psychological or emotional needs, and spiritual needs. Uh, and you can meet those needs. Some people that have physical needs, maybe they just need to have a, a time of rest. Uh, maybe they need someone to, to make them a meal because they had such a busy week. We can have emotional or psychological needs where we need to know that someone cares for us and, and they could hear us uh, and, and just be with us or laugh with us or share some special event with us. And we have spiritual needs as well. Sometimes we need an encouraging word or someone to pray for us or someone to share what they've been learning and their excitement about God. We can all meet any one of those areas. We are gifted in those ways to meet those needs. And each one has been gifted to serve one another as good stewards. Uh, st stewardship or steward is a figurative language. It means a manager, one who is running an operation that doesn't belong to him. So it looks at our, our whole life, our bodies, our talents, the things that we can do, our, our personalities. They're all given to us by God. And we're to use them in serving one another, it, which is his will, which is our new direction. And notice it says... We're stewards of the manifold grace of God. Manifold means many different kinds and varieties, a diversity of grace, which makes you uniquely gifted. Uh, so there are three key ideas in this verse. Number one, you have at least one gift to offer and help others. You are special. Don't downplay what God has given you and God has gifted you. Number two, it's given to you by God's grace. It's not your own. Tomorrow it could be taken away. This is God's grace, your life, your resources, uh, your talents, abilities. Then number three, the gift or gifts that God has given you are designed and intended to be used in serving the needs of others, specifically the body. God's gifts and, and empowerment of believers, both you and me, to meet the needs of as part of his loving pr provision for his people. Do you, you understand what that means? Is that we get the privilege of being used by God. You and I. Uh, love finds expression in the use of our gifts, our spiritual gifts, gifts given to us by God. Not for self-advancement or to draw attention to ourselves, but for the benefit of others. So building on these three ideas that you have a gift, it's from God's grace, and that it's supposed to be used for service, Paul then writes in verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God, and whoever speak, uh, serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Notice here that Peter doesn't give a list of gifts. Although Paul has four other lists, uh, this is actually considered the fifth list of spiritual gifts in the New Testament, not one of those lists is alike. And not one gift is in all five lists. So what does that tell us? It tells us that any of those lists, that's not comprehensive. We can't say, okay, here's the 19, 20, whatever number of gifts there are, pick which one you are, see where you are, and then do that. 1 Corinthians 7.7 7 talks about whether you were given the gift of marriage or the gift of celibacy as a gift, a charismata of God. So there are many different gifts of God, even far more than what's listed in the New Testament. We shouldn't limit the abilities that God has given his people to those lists. They're merely examples. So Peter does give two general categories of gifts. The first one is gifts involving speaking. And we must communicate in those gifts when we're serving other people, not our human opinion, but the utterances of God. We are is to speak uh, as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Uh, and it's the utterances of God as they are revealed in Scripture. The only thing that's actually going to help people, uh, physical psychological, spiritual needs are going to come from the wisdom and the truth that's found in Scripture. So those who are ministering and serving, using their talents and gifts uh, for God and others, they need to do so realizing that anything that's useful, it comes from God's Word. And not from you, but from God. And then 
gifts of action. And those who are serving by the strength that God supplies. So these serve dependent on the physical ability and strength given by God. Not on your own human merit or strength or power, uh, but we need to ask God humbly for strength and his blessing on our service. And the point here of either uh, speaking or serving gifts is that you can't serve apart from God's grace. So, the question I have for you all is, how are you gifted? How has God uniquely made you, crafted you? And how are you using it? Your, your gifts, your talents, your abilities. How's that going? Do you have this mentality concerning your gifts and abilities that they're from God and that you're supposed to be using them? Are you using the time that God has given you to meet the needs of others? Peter concludes his thought by giving the purpose for pointing out uh, the fact that our abilities come from God and whether they are speaking or serving is given so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What he's simply saying here is that Jesus Christ created a people gifted by the Spirit so that through us he would demonstrate the magnificence of God's character and nature uh, as a recognition and a manifestation of his goodness. And we all get to do this. He is using us. And therefore, to whom belong the glory, meaning the recognition and the fame, and the dominion, meaning his rule, his sovereignty, uh, is Jesus. He is good. And we want his good rule forever and ever. Uh, we long for his rule forever and ever. Then when he rules perfectly, then society and the world will be perfect. And that only comes when he sets up his kingdom, his earthly kingdom. And to that idea, to those ideas, him having the credit and the dominion and the glory, and, and that will fill all things, Peter says, Amen. Uh, when you say amen, it's a transliteration of a Hebrew word. So when you say the word amen, you're speaking Hebrew. Uh, and it means, so be it, or it is true. It's spoken when the hearer accepts and affirms the truthfulness of the statement, the previous statement. Uh, so in closing, I want to show you two things about the passage as a whole. Look at the corporate nature of God's will, his new direction among his people. Uh, we're to keep fervent in your love for one another. We're to be hospitable to one another. We're supposed to employ our gifts in serving one another. The new direction that God has given you, his will is very corporate. You pray towards God as an individual prayer where you're praying mindfully and aligning your will with his. But then when you carry it out, it's all done within a community. You were saved and granted entrance into God's family to make a difference to those in the family. The essence of the Christian life is to be influencing others for good. Secondly, I want to show you the, the structure, uh, the connection of these. The foundation is mindful praying. It's our relationship with God. It's through prayer. It's our foundation for spiritual life uh, where we align ourselves with God's will and we commune with God. The means of carrying out His will, the new direction, is through spiritual gifts given to us by God for others. The motive for carrying out his will is love that brings unity. And then the opportunity to, for carrying out this new direction, his will, that's hospitality. That's in our homes, the place where we use our gifts and our lives uh, out of love for one another. So here, these are the four instructions, practical instructions for living the new way according to God's will. So let's look at applications. Number one, we must have sound judgment and controlled thinking in order to pray intelligently, intentionally, and with clear thought because our time on earth to do God's will is short. Do you pray the will of God throughout the day? Number two, we must be devoted to one another in love. Love forgives and maintains unity among the body. This must be our preeminent object of prayer and purpose because it's God's will for his church. Number three, we must practice hospitality without complaining. 
about it so we can create an environment for valuing, serving, and loving people. This must be an object of prayer in purpose because it's God's will for his church. Number four, we must use the unique gifts God has given us to serve the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. This must be an object of prayer and purpose because it's God's will for his church. Number five, the use of our gifts, uh, whether through words or actions, demonstrate God's graciousness and his provision for his people. We get to be used by God to serve others uh, out of love in spheres of hospitality. In all that we do, he must receive the glory. And then number six, finally, the realization that the end is near should cause us to pray for and live out God's will in the time that, he, that we have left. And nothing else can take priority or become a distraction. And that is Peter's instructions for the community of God concerning our new direction in life.